As an audio engineering major, sound design is something that I constantly find myself thinking about whenever I consume media. Be it movies, TV shows, or sometimes even commercials, my mind tends to hone in on the more technical aspects of whatever I'm watching as opposed to what it's trying to show me. Was that particular background song the director's choice or the sound engineer's? Did a Foley artist add those footsteps in post or were they captured on set? Was that overused eagle sound effect really necessary? I know from personal experience that these questions could have any number of answers. Sound editing is an incredibly difficult and meticulous process, but at the same time, it's not just about adding footsteps or cleaning up vocals. The inclusion of certain sounds in film, especially music, can be as expressive as any other narrative and stylistic elements of cinematic form. Music can be intrinsic, helping to tell the story, whether it pertains to plot, action, character, or mood. One film that perfectly captures this idea is Stanley Kubrick's 1968 movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey. In this award-winning piece of cinematic history, the inclusion of leitmotifs, or recurrent musical works throughout the film, evoke certain emotions within their respective scenes and subtly communicate important themes to the audience. The two most prominent leitmotifs within 2001 are Sprach Zarathustra. The, that sounds stupid. The two most prominent leitmotifs within 2001 are Sprach Zarathustra and the polyphonic pieces from composer Georgi Ligeti. Through the repetition of these works, Kubrick, alongside his sound editor Winston Ryder and sound mixer H.L. Bird, provoke questions about humanity's place in the universe and immerse viewers in the world of the movie. Let's begin with our more recognizable song, Sprach Zarathustra, or The Spoke Zarathustra, by Richard Strauss. At this point, everyone and their grandma recognizes this iconic piece paired with the scene of the sun rising over the earth. It's become synonymous with inspiration, eureka moments, and other discoveries. The portion used by Kubrick is the opening fanfare of the tone poem, and is pointedly called Sunrise. After its initial introduction, we hear this song again during the Dawn of Man sequence as the ape invents his first tool, signifying the evolution from animal to human. Paired with the triumphant cinematography, the score helps to convey the importance of this glorious discovery and marks the beginning of the human race as we know it. We hear this song again at the very end of the film after our main character David jumps through time and turns into this weird space baby thing. Even if we as the audience aren't entirely sure what this means at first, the inclusion of the song helps to signify another step in human evolution, just like we saw at the beginning of the movie. From monkey to man to star child, Sprach Zarathustra's repetitive use helps to convey the wonder of humanity's journey through time and the universe. However, before either of these evolutions can take place, we are introduced to the mysterious black monolith. The three pieces composed by Georgie Ligeti, all circled here, accompany this strange object with creepy, dissonant vocals that signify its otherworldliness. It's unclear whether or not this is a diegetic or non-diegetic source. Regardless, the characters on screen are impacted in strange, transcendental ways whenever it plays. Just like the previous song, the monolith theme plays multiple times throughout the film. The first time we hear it is when it appears to the apes. After careful investigation, they begin clamoring towards the monolith, each creature trying to reach out and touch it. Once they do, we're greeted with the invention of man's first tool, hinting at the fact that this all-knowing block somehow granted the ape the knowledge to do so. The next time the obelisk appears is when the space crew sent to Jupiter finds it. Just like the monkeys, one of them reaches out and brushes it with his fingers, but nothing happens. At least not yet. The evolution actually comes later at the very end of the film. Once Dave is sucked into a vortex of colorful lights and carried across time and space, we hear the monolith theme once again. The inclusion of this song within the scene helps tie it to the idea of knowledge beyond our human comprehension. When we see David reach out to the obelisk without the music, it feels unsettling, but his evolution into the space fetus is no surprise. Featuring dense layers of sound textures in lieu of more traditional melody, these pieces defy conventional interpretation and convey the unknowable mystery of the monolith, its powers, its origins, and the nature of the beings that created it. Another movie that uses orchestral music as a leitmotif is the 2022 film The Batman, directed by Matt Reeves. Although more down-to-earth, both literally and figuratively, this movie also employs one piece of music, or songs like it, to establish mood and emphasize the presence of certain characters or themes. As you can probably guess from the song playing right now, this gritty thriller chooses Franz Schubert's Ave Maria as the theme for its main villain, the Riddler. If you haven't seen the film, this guy isn't anything like his comic book counterpart or previous renditions of him in film. Instead of goofy puzzles or gimmicks, his riddles take the shape of horrific murders against Gotham City's officials. So where does Ave Maria come in? 
Well, a twisted minor key version of the classic melody, composed by Michael Giacchino, plays constantly throughout the film, creating a sense of unease just with how wrong it sounds, but the song itself is only played a handful of times. Just like in 2001 A Space Odyssey, the movie opens with its leitmotif as the Riddler watches Gotham's current mayor and his family from a distance, the only sounds being his heavy breathing and Schubert's sweet melody. Suspense builds as we watch the plot move forward, waiting for something bad to happen. And it does. We hear the song again during the mayor's funeral. It's sung by a choir of children as Bruce Wayne, one of cinema's top three orphans, stares at the politician's son, a boy who had found his father dead only the night before. Disaster strikes moments later as a car crashes through the cathedral and another one of Riddler's twisted games are set in motion. The final time we hear the song is from another diegetic on-screen source. The Riddler himself sings a stunningly beautiful rendition of it while imprisoned at Arkham. Doesn't that just tug on your heartstrings? This humble Catholic prayer is constantly associated with death and represents the Riddler's disdain for how Gotham has thrown people like him to the side in favor of the rich and powerful. The despair and wish for safety during sleep in Schubert's lyrics are echoed by the Riddler in his description of his childhood as an orphan, and perhaps explain why this melody was chosen to soundtrack his character. As you can see from these two movies, sound design isn't just about making a scene more realistic. The repetition of certain songs throughout a film can emphasize the tone of a scene and even clue the audience in on key plot points. Both of these films push the envelope for their respective genres. 2001 uses spectacular visual effects and asks controversial metaphysical questions, while the Batman subverts audience expectations from previous depictions of its characters. Although their sound design isn't the only reason these films have garnered such positive reactions from audiences, their skillful use of the leitmotif certainly didn't hurt. 